So, Rosemary, I'd like you to tell me your first memory in wine and how you became interested Ooh. in it. Okay, first memory, family holiday, 1960, packaged to Brittany with my parents. And I was allowed a sip of daddy's wine, age 10. You know. I'm thinking back, it was probably, if it was the house wine, it was probably Algerian. <laughs> and I wasn't too young, I think it was red wine one evening and then white wine the next. I didn't like either particularly. So the first one I think I can remember quite liking was Henkel Trocken on holiday about four years later, you know, frothy and slightly sweet. And then I think the next Christmas I was allowed champagne. That's what good. And then I joined the London University Wine Society. So this is back in 1968. And um, that was a time the wine trade could afford to be quite generous with its tastings. I did get some quite good tastings and that sort of set me off. You know, and then what did you do with a history degree? Well, I thought if I learned to type, somebody would give, might be, give me a job when the wine society did. So I, you know, that, I went for an interview, was offered a glass of champagne as well as a job, and it was a secretarial job. And I thought, hmm, that sounds rather good. <laughs> so that's how it started. Fabulous. And then in 1979, you became one of the first mm. female MWs. Yes. I, saw, I passed with Aileen True, who's sadly no longer with us, and we mm. doubled the female content of the Institute overnight. <laughs> and we made the middle page of the Evening Standard, and unfortunately it was the same day the IRA had blown up Mountbatten. So we were in the midday edition, and I was about to buy up lots of copies and suddenly realised the headlines had changed. <laughs> A lot of competition for the news that day. Yes. Um, and how was the experience studying the MW in, in the 70s? Well, it's, I, I think I would say accurate. It's, I think it's, it was easier then because the world of wine was just so much smaller. You know, had you told me when I passed the exams in 79 that 20 year, less than 20 years later I would write a book on New Zealand wine, I would have thought, God, they don't make wine in New Zealand, do they? <laughs> you know, I mean, France... France, the, the tasting was France, Germany, Italy a little bit, you know, Spain, Rioja was just coming into, onto the market. I mean, the new world, I suppose, sherry, South Africa produced sherry, Australia produced tawny port. If you wanted to show you were really up to date on your theory, you got an example or two from California. Um, that was it. No, it, was, <laughs> it was a completely different world. Would you yeah. choose to undertake the MW today? Considering well, I the suppose, difference in the exams? Yes, I suppose you're, when you're doing the exam, you're, you're, you're working from you know, what's happening now. You know, so your study experience is you know, like the new wines. I mean, you think if you took your driving test now, I frankly, I'd be terrified, but you've grown up with it. So it's sort of, <laughs> is you're at the level, you know, I suppose. I mean, I remember actually when doing the theory exam, somebody produced the papers from 1957. We all looked at them, oh my God, we're doing this exam 20 years too late. <laughs> so. And you've been writing about wine significantly for over 40 years. I start my, well, Shabli, my first book on Shabli was published in 1984. I started writing after I left the wine trade in 1981. I found a publisher with two phone calls. <laughs> Would you believe it? <laughs> I rang, I rang Christie's and Michael Broadbent said, oh, that won't sell. So I rang Sotheby's and a friend in the wine department said, oh, I'll get the publishing department to you know, consider the idea. And they came back saying, do us a synopsis. And it's my first book on Chablis. Fabulous. And then you've also specialised very significantly in, in the Languedoc. Yes. Um, and you've just released your new newest book on the region. Uh, can you tell me a bit about the region, how you've seen it evolve and, and what really oh, excites God. you about the Languedoc today? I think what's happening with the Languedoc today is it's just there's so much new, so many new producers. I suppose new, the areas are being appreciated. I mean, now you're one of the sort of more fashionable areas, if you want, for want of a better word, is the Terrasse du Larzac. You know, when I went to the Languedoc in the late 1980s, nobody had heard of the Terrasse du Larzac. And indeed, some of the villages that now make Terrasse du Larzac were not classified in the appellation Côte du Languedoc, and that's created in 1985 because it was deemed the you know it was the area was too cool, it was up in the hills, you know the grapes wouldn't ripen, so that's um so the long time has changed. Also, I mean the Languedoc was very much um dominated by cooperatives, but you've got things happening like you know Master Mascasac was starting up first vintage in the late 70s, um, and there were little pockets of quality. I remember meeting a wonderful guy in La Clap who was, you know, making this really exciting white wine that was totally unlike anything else that was produced in the area. Um, and I think, you know, it's an area that's, you know, it's woken up and, and continues to sort of, it continues to surprise me. I mean, there's always lots of new, new things happening and lots of new producers. 
And I think one of the interesting things is actually you know, where they come from, what has brought them to the long docks. There are a lot of outsiders. There is a group called the Outsiders. And it's not just, you know, it's foreigners and it's also other people from other parts of France. Fabulous. And do you think the industry here in the UK has woken up to the Languedoc yet? I still think the choice of long dock wines available in the UK is quite limited compared to what there could be. Mm. You know, I mean, the, lar- the large importers, shall we say supermarkets and things here, have a fairly unimaginative range of long dock wines on the whole. You know, they tend to go for the big boys, obviously, because mm. they need quantity. Whereas I think, um, and I, but I think there are, so there are some smaller importers you know, who are you know, quite trying to do things, be, be more imaginative in their range. Okay. But I found, I mean, I did a piece on for decanter of my 30 top white wines. But a lot of the wines I would actually like to have included weren't, weren't brought into the country. So It's always tricky. Which is, yes. <laughs> and so as well as writing for print press um, like decanter, you're also a regular blogger. Yes, um, can on you... the long dock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you see the worlds of traditional print press and wine blogs interplaying oh, at the moment? And how do you see that in the future? What would be your... Kind of That's a, I started <laughs> blogging. My original thing was, oh, I'm not going to blog. You know, I like quite, quite like to get paid for writing. But then actually, I read a very interesting article in the Society of Authors magazine, which was suggesting if you consider yourself to be an expert in the subject, if you blog about it, it kind of, if you like, it's self advertising in a sort of low key sort of way, and it get keeps your name out there. Mm. And I expect one or two things. I've been asked to do one or two things because people know me for doing uh, the long writing about the long dog. As a, as a blogger. I, mean, I think the trouble about blogging is that you have no idea, really, if you read somebody's blog, how well informed they really are. I mean, I said in my blog that I've been visiting the Long Dock for so many, you know, so many years. But, you know, people go on the net and just write and really, with, you know, they may be, may, what they're writing about may not be very substanti- substantial or substantiated. So I think, and I, I mean, I think it would be a shame if you know, the written word sort of declined at the expense of the you know electronic word and I think it'd be a shame if wine books disappeared because there's nothing like you know turning the printed page looking at photographs and things <laughs> I agree uh, and you split your time between France and England um I have a couple of questions related to that what's your pet peeve about each country <laughs> my pet peeve oh god I think my pet peeve when I come back to London from France is it's kind of how busy London is, and it's people who are looking at their mobile phones as though they're the only person in the street. <laughs> you know, it's like you say, something walking straight towards you. Because, excuse me, please, and they look at you as they're completely mad. You know, it's that kind of, and everything you ate, it's much busier, and you know, the kind of, because you get into a kind of more, you know, village routine. I suppose the trouble about living in a French village is that, um, you know, in London, we're spot for public transport. If I want to go anywhere in France, when we're in the long dock, you know, you've got to get in a car. And that's a, because I'm not a, I'm not a very relaxed driver, so <laughs> I'd you know I'd walk walk if I can, but you know a bus isn't an option, nor is a taxi when you've been out to dinner. You know, it is in London. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Uber has not yet got to the wilds <laughs> of the long dog. <laughs> Maybe that's an opportunity. Yeah. And what's your favourite thing about uh, living in in both countries? What do you enjoy most about oh, being in your different your different realities? <laughs> But I love, I, but I love the bustle of London. I think London's a very exciting city. You know, there's a lot going on in London. Uh, you know, the the choice of theatres, concerts, you know, lots of friends, or just that excitement of a big city. But I suppose for me, then it's the contrast that you know, in the long dot we have a house on the edge of a village. You know, it's more of a country, you know, countryside existence. And I mean, especially, I mean, the difference between in London, London in a heat wave and the long dock in a heat wave, in the long dock we have a swimming pool, <laughs> you know, air conditioning in our bedroom, you know, and travel in an air conditioned car, none of which happened in London. You know. <laughs> Absolutely, that sounds nice. That's, that's... <laughs> and so you've just released your, your book on the wines of the long dock. What's next? What are you working on? Oh, well, I've just started Shabley Mark Three. I actually started writing it on Monday, having spent three weeks there in June. So it's really, it's an update of this, my second book on Chablis, which was sort of 25 years on from the first book. So I suppose the thing that kind of amused me, this this book, I'm meeting the grandchildren of the people I met in the first book. Oh, nice. Seeing how that, you know, how they've evolved. So it's quite, so that's quite fun. Fabulous. Sort of, and when can we expect to see that? Well, my deadline is March next year. Super. And then after that, I have a contract to write Roussillon. Woohoo! Okay. Which the deadline <laughs> for that is August 2020, whether that will happen. <laughs> 
Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>